the following is dead. I don't want to stay in a lane. I don't want to stay in one box. That's why you don't want to niche down in the first place. I followed my gut and it worked. Welcome back to the Cypress Room, where we dive deep on influencing with integrity. This is a podcast for creators, and I'm Christina Mascari. And I'm Maggie Honeycutt, and welcome back to the Cypress Room live from Haven Conference. It has been We're an amazing... We're laughing a little bit. We're <laughs> yeah. laughing a little bit, because I'm going to tell you, we have already started this podcast, but we didn't record our audio. Yes. So we are starting <laughs> over. And this is a testament to you that, you know, sometimes mistakes happen, but you got to recover. Yes. So I'm glad that we figured out our audio was not working. Too. Because we have an incredible guest today that yes, you need do. to hear, and she's one of our favorites. Yes, and <laughs> you guys have probably heard her name mentioned on this podcast by several creators because she has helped so many people in this space grow their businesses, encourage them. She's been a cheerleader behind the scenes, um, but she's very successful in her own platforms as well. So we just want to welcome Monica Chavez of House of Esperanza. To the Cypress so, Room. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited. <laughs> yes, yeah, so we're so excited to be here. And before we dive in, I'll go ahead and read a little bit about Monica and then we'll get we'll started. Get right we'll in. get right into it. <laughs> Monica is a DIY CEO and the creative force behind House of Esperanza. She's a lifelong DIYer and she shares unique home projects along with smaller budget friendly updates, all while sharing the joys and struggles of motherhood. A California native, she served five years in the United States Marine Corps, followed by 10 years as a 911 dispatcher. Now she is taking her life skills combined with the values taught to her by immigrant parents to inspire others where she can. And she does an amazing job of that. So welcome to our podcast. Thank you so much for being here. <laughs> Thank you for having me. I'm really, when I said I'm excited, like I'm excited. I love just talking shop and I can talk about the industry for hours. So I know. And we'll Monica <laughs> did a keynote speech the first night at Haven. Oh my gosh. It was phenomenal. Page you have a page of notes. <laughs> so she's going <laughs> to dig even deeper with us today. So this is definitely something you're going to want to stay tuned till the end for, because there's going to be so many nuggets of wisdom that you can take and implement in your own business and journey as a content creator. So let's get into it, Monica. Let's, get into it. let's tell us back from the beginning, mm -hmm. you know, you said you had immigrant parents. Mm -hmm. And I know that that is something that has to have shaped and molded you. And it's why you're where you're at today. Can you tell us sort of how your journey to a content creator came to be and what that was formed out of? Yes. When growing up, we didn't have a lot of resources and we grew up poor and being a first generation kid, there's a lot that comes with that, whether it's, you know, parenting your parents in the process, mm -hmm. because my mom didn't speak English for a while and having to translate things or helping raise your siblings. There's that parentification there, having to deal with that and watching my parents just live to survive and not necessarily thriving. But I knew they were creative and I would see that everywhere from them. And I had that creative bug and I always wanted to create and make things with my hands and anything I saw, I'm like, oh, I could, I think I could make that. And as a kid, I would take things apart and put them back together. And my parents, thankfully, would never get that mad about me tearing things apart and putting them back because I like to see how things work and I like to modify them to fit whatever it was that I needed. I remember one time as a kid, I idolized Martha Stewart. Like I, she was just like the ultimate for me. She gardened and she cooked and she crafted and she just had this way about her. Like she was just a boss. And I remember in the, I went in the kitchen and I took some dishes and I broke them because I wanted to make this like mosaic, like th I don't even know what I was doing. <laughs> this mosaic like outdoor side table and I ruined my mom's dishes. And we didn't have dishes for a long time and they didn't get mad. And I'm so lucky, like if my kids did that now, I would, I would be so mad. <laughs> but I was being creative and they saw that in me and they were like, it's okay, just next time. Let's try to figure out something else. Watching my mom sew our clothes because we couldn't buy any, mend our clothes to make them last longer. The hand-me-downs we were getting from family that we were, or had, that we were handing down ourselves, she would mend them. So I learned to sew from a very young age watching my dad fix things around the house because we couldn't afford the plumber or the roofer or the electrician and holding the flashlight for him, handing him that hammer. I picked up on things and he taught me the names of tools. And 
now when we're, we work on projects together when I'm lucky enough to see him to do that, it's very nostalgic and it's just memories that I hold on to and knowledge that I have going forward the rest of my life. And now when I do projects at home and my kids are with me, if they want to help, I'm like, yes, please. And it's going to take longer. Yeah. And some mm -hmm. people are like, how do you do with kids? And how do you do? Just let, let them help safely, mm -hmm. obviously. Let them help. Teach them the things. Let them be involved. You're making memories. And that knowledge is going to be with them forever for the rest of their lives. We, my mom uh, gardened and my grandma gardened. And everywhere we would go, my grandma would, you know, cut a clipping of something when she would see a plant and put it in her pocket. And so, like, propagation, like, I learned that word as an adult. I'm like, that's what it's called, <laughs> you know? And we would always be like, we have to wait for grandma. She's in the, you know, like, we're walking. And she stopped to, like, clip a, 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 a clipping. And wow. now I've got, you know, fancy propagation stations that, you know, are made out of wood that my friends make and I support. Uh, but I learned those things from my grandmother and from my mom, growing food, taking our food scraps and regrowing them. And now everybody's like, look at these food hacks and sustainability. And I'm like, we were doing that when we were young because we were poor. So all of those things come with me through life and really mm. shape who I was as a human being and being appreciative for what I have. Thanks and for joining us in the Cypress Room today. Your support means so much to us and we wanted to share a new way that you can invest in our community. We now have our own store where you can get your Cypress Room merch like hoodies, shirts, hats, and more. And not only can you rep the Cypress Room brand and its mission of influencing with integrity, but your purchase will directly help fund this channel. That way we can keep bringing you interviews with your favorite creators and all the knowledge you need to help grow your brand and your business. Our shop is linked in the description box of every video we make, and you can also view pictures of each product tagged in each video, and we really appreciate your support. I grew up in the hood, in a very, very rough part of a big city, and I didn't know any different. For me, that was like, oh no, this isn't how everybody lives. And then I left when I joined the Marine Corps and met people from all over the country and traveled to all parts of the world. And it just really broadened my life experiences, my worldviews, meeting with people. And I realized, oh, not everybody, nobody grew up like that. Like y'all didn't have friends mm -hmm. that, you know, were in jail or were killed in a drive-by. Like there's just so much there. It's a completely different life. And then I, I, when I went back after leaving the Marine Corps, I went back to the hood and I'm like, this is what I know. Got a job as a 911 dispatcher. And that's when people were like, oh, you're from that part of town? And I'm like, what? what's the big deal? And that's when I realized, and I would receive the calls from that side of town and be able to compare them to the rest of the wow. city. Oh, wow. what, really what I escaped and survived and was able to get out of there. And my younger sister, very similar story. She went on to, um, she's a scientist. She has a, a doctorate in chemistry. Like that's, that's our, in our family, that's one of like, you know, our biggest hour, I say hour. It's <laughs> one of our biggest like, accomplishments. <laughs> my parents that. are very proud of her. Yeah. You know? um, I failed to mention that my dad was also a Marine, a retired career Marine. So I wanted to follow in his footsteps and yeah. do okay. something like that. Yeah. Um, and then I was ready to come home and do something different. Did the 911 dispatching. Um, because I was looking for something that was very similar to what I had done, paramilitary structure. Um, I came, I, someone referred to me, one of my supervisors when I was a dispatcher, uh, said I, was, I had very sharp edges. And I took that as a compliment. And she meant that as a compliment. Mm -hmm. I was very disciplined, like business yeah. is business. I kept my personal stuff. Like nobody knew my personality. It was very, I was, I was like your perfect uh, employee marine type of person so i excelled at what i did as a dispatcher because it was very similar structure um, and i went on to become a supervisor and train people and i really enjoy instruction and teaching people and then i was ready after about 10 years i was ready for something different i needed some positivity in my life um, working as a dispatcher for a city of a million mm. people you see you hear it's mostly hearing yeah. obviously um, a lot a lot of things. Nobody calls you on a good day when you're a dispatcher. Like people yeah. are calling you because they're in crisis. And while I was doing that job on the weekends, all I wanted to do was make stuff, just make something. I had an Etsy shop. I would like crochet. <laughs> yeah. I would sell little things. Yeah, yeah. I would sell them. I just wanted to make and be creative. And I could not wait to get off my 14 hour shift so I can go home and do that. And I didn't care how tired I was. And it was time. Me and my husband had a conversation. We set up, we were fortunate 
enough to have worked hard enough and be blessed to make financial smart decisions financially and set ourselves up, set ourselves up so that I could leave that job mm -hmm. and leave the security of a retirement plan and the health benefits and keep growing our family because we knew we wanted to have children and also focus on my creativity because I needed that after a grueling 15 years of yeah. the line of work that I was in. And I just went, I went in head first on my creativity and just started really tapping into those things that I had put, you know, in the back of, of my, of my head and started sewing again and started gardening and started looking for other people online that were doing the same, if similar things that would be able to connect with me, that I could have those conversations with because back home, I had my parents, they, 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 they got it, but I didn't have close friends and family. Otherwise, that I could have those conversations with, you know, that understood the creative mind or the neurodivergence behind all of that. Mm -hmm. And I was longing for that connection. So I started a blog just randomly. I was like, I don't know what I'm, you know, <laughs> doing. I'm just writing into the Internet. It's like a little journal. And we're talking like tw after 2010s, um, very early on, had no idea what I was doing took the most terrible photos, you know, and wrote like the worst long blogs, but that's where it started for me. And, and sharing whatever it was I was making in that moment at that time creatively. And it, it grew from there. And then Instagram was born. So I went over there and started posting those photos, those terrible photos, <laughs> and writing those captions. Um, and I did that. So I've been full-time, like I, I would say full-time content creator for about eight years now mm -hmm. and learned a lot along the way and filled forward a lot along that way yeah. and made so many mistakes. And when I would try to ask people at industry events or online, everything was really gay kept. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was very much like, oh no, you're my competition. Yeah. I'm not sharing yeah. my secrets with you yeah. or my success. And that I struggled with that. And I really resented mm -hmm. it as a job because of that. As I've gained the experience and as I've grown and grown my community, I want to make sure that other content creators in not only in just our industry, but others don't have to learn the hard way mm -hmm. and go through all that many failed forward attempts. And that's why I created the School of Esperanza for content creators. Mm -hmm. And it's a really wonderful, inclusive and safe space. And I call it, you know, place for misfits, because if you've ever felt like you have never fit in any other group yeah. Yeah. or sat at a table mm -hmm. or been, you know, kind of turned away from other places, like we got you. You can hang out here. We share education information. It's a community community led network, and I really really like that because the entire burden isn't on me. Because I'm not the expert about everything. Right. I don't know everything, but we can find that information so somewhere. Somebody out there does. Yeah. Oh, I think that's so cool that you created out of your own need. You saw this need mm -hmm. in the in the creator space for a community, mm -hmm. and you just created it for someone like you yeah. didn't sit back and wait for somebody else like oh I wish that this existed yeah. you just did it and you know we've had Kyle from Kyle did it mm -hmm. and Vanessa and you know the stories that have come out of that school mm -hmm. I mean I can't even imagine just that ripple effect because I think you're not only teaching people what you know they're then going out and doing that for mm -hmm. other people and that multiplication factor is just so cool i yes. think yeah. the impact that that is making on this creator community is huge like yes. probably beyond what you'll ever even realize well she actually just got to witness it because Did you? we just sat in a class and maybe you didn't recognize it so i'm gonna say it to you so hopefully you do <laughs> because we just came from a class that kyle taught that was packed to the gills standing room only mm -hmm. and it was amazing content where he's mm -hmm. sharing secrets letting go of all the gatekeeping, showing people how they can actually succeed and being really honest, like, hey, if you've done this, this, and this, all I've shared and it's not working, you might need to move on and find something else. And like that, I, where his success is, obviously he has a lot to do with his success, but there is a tiny piece where if you would have never said, Kyle, you can charge this brand, mm -hmm. even though you only have a thousand viewers and now looking at where he is today, you just sat in that class. Yeah. Do you realize like looking around, do you see the multiplication that just I happened? See, yes, I see the impact. Like, okay. I'm not going to take credit for, no, you know, his yes, work. I understand. absolutely, I see the impact. <laughs> and I mean, it's his story is his story to tell. Right. But, but I will say, because I don't know if he, if he mentioned it or will ever mention it. Um, I 
I feel like I found him. I don't remember what year it was, but I found him early on. And I've been a creator for so long and I am chronically online. Like I, and I'm really good at um, formulating patterns. I can spot patterns. And when I see a creator, I can see this like magic. I'm like, and I, I call it that, like this person has magic. And my husband knows what I'm talking about now. Like this person has magic. And he's like, what are you talking about? And Kyle was one of the first men mm-hmm. in our space where I felt like he's worth, he's worth investing my time and energy in as a mentor. Mm-hmm. Um, so I would just once in a while shoot him a message. I remember I sent him a vacuum. <laughs> I sent him a, I sent him a, a like a shop vac. Cause he said one day in a story, like, you know, he didn't have something that he was trying to clean his garage and it was messy. We're talking about probably like 2021, maybe years ago. And I sent him a shop vac and that like, that's like really where it catapulted our friendship outside yeah. of Instagram, outside of social. And after that, like, I would, I just saw the magic in him and I really wanted him to know, like, you've got what it takes. I see it in you. There's something about you in the way, and this is like early on, not not today's storytelling, yeah. Kyle, but early on, I, I yeah. saw it in there, and I wanted I, him to know that and not let it go. I was like, mm-hmm. please don't let this flame die out. Mm-hmm. You are going to do great things, and he's gone on to do that. And I we I basically convinced him to like quit his job, or was at least integral in yeah. that part of telling him like, no, you can do this full time as a right. creator. Um, and encourage him to do so. And, and I hold my own retreats now with the school and he uh, speaks when that's in that topic of storytelling. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's why I said it's one of my favorite topics of yeah. his because he's so good he's at so it. so good at it. Yeah. And now other people get to hear that and that, yeah. I do see that impact and it makes me very yeah. happy. Him and Vanessa are one of the ODs in the school. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And they're one of our lead, they're two of our lead mentors and mm-hmm. that makes me really excited. And that's what makes our group so awesome it's because it's community led you get yeah. to see people grow you get to count on somebody else for information regardless of where you are on your path as a content creator mm-hmm. we've all started there at the beginning yeah. Yeah. and being able to share that information and then watching them just like be free and fly yeah. is is very fulfilling well when we were looking at your background and like what you did before you did content creation i'm like oh the marine background I can see it because like you are disciplined and you're Mm -hmm. great at gathering people as well. But there was like that creative part was stifled during that time and it wanted to come out. And isn't it beautiful that you did find something where you can merge both of those? Yes. And Mm -hmm. you just, you lead people Mm -hmm. like so well and you lead people from a place that empowers them and lifts them up and be able to take it on on their own instead of like delegating and be like, you have to do it this way. Like you're very Mm -hmm. good at pulling out in people what you see and spotting that, which Mm -hmm. is like, you could do so many other businesses with, you know, all the noodles of time that you have, but right. it's just a beautiful thing to watch the way you lead as someone who's not in your school, but like admires your school you. and admires the people in it. And mm-hmm. so I just wanted to honor you today and say like, what a beautiful leader that you are. Thank you. Yeah. And, and I'm actually really glad you brought that up because that was a hard lesson for me to learn and remind myself about the human element, mm-hmm. especially after mi- the military. Yeah. And once I was dispatching and having to take care of the dispatchers that worked around me during critical incidents or really traumatic calls, I'm like, oh, there's the human element. Mm-hmm. We're not robots. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like I came from that culture where it was like you, it, you showed nothing. You took orders and said how high on your way. Like you jumped. Well, what's that saying? I'm going to butcher it right now because I'm. Um, if somebody says jump, you say how high, how high, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I came from that You're mindset. Like, it's hard for me to say because I don't have that <laughs> But not only, not only as the, the part of my career and in, adu- in the adulthood, but being raised by my father, yeah. who came from that mentality, mm-hmm. who's very strict. Mm-hmm. We, it was very, very militarized structure in our household. So I thrive under that structure, or so I, you know, thought I did, and then come to find out, like, no, I want to be a free spirit too. <laughs> Um, so I, I've been able to implement those skills, the things that I've learned, my experiences, but also my innate instincts to do things mm-hmm. as well, the way that I want to. And it's all really just, it comes out beautifully in the things that I do with people. And I never, ever want it to be about me, mm-hmm. which is why my business and my brand is called House of Esperanza. Mm-hmm. It's not House of Monica or yeah. Monica Chavez. I mm-hmm. never wanted it to be about me. It is, we are, we are the House of Esperanza. Mm-hmm. And that name, Esperanza in Spanish, means hope. 
Oh. And now I named my brand before I had my daughter. I named my daughter Esperanza. We call her Essie. Everybody know, on, if you follow me, you know that. She's so cute. <laughs> She's so cute. Um, <laughs> and I named it House of Esperanza, House of Hope. And I tell people my house was built on hope for mm-hmm. various reasons and the various things that I've gone through in my life that are really, really difficult. Mm-hmm. My house was built on hope and mm-hmm. everything I've done. <clears throat> Everything I've done yeah. has been because we always just had that hope yeah. to make it happen. I love it's and beautiful. It's a community. It really, really is. It it's- really is. Mm-hmm. And like, I just want to sit here because I know it's hard to like tout yourself and receive like when people are saying, because I just even see you being like, well, I'm not going to take credit because these people are wonderful. And yes, and I'm not asking you to take credit, but like you have built something so beautiful and mm-hmm. something really true and something authentic. And it shows like whenever I meet one of the people that is connected to you, like it shows. And I know it's not just you, but like not everybody is willing to step out and be like, I'll be the person that leads. It is very hard to do that. It's a burden. It's a weight. Um, You're shepherding people. Mm -hmm. You're discipling people. Like that is a very beautiful thing. And it's something that is so needed in community. So I just want to honor you and thank you. Thank you. (laughs) Tell I'm like a Monica fan. I know. Like I just... (laughs) I know that I'm sure there's people pouring into you all the time, but I would be amiss to like have you in this chair for an hour and not just tell you like you've made an impact on my life. I remember the first time I met you at Haven, I had just started following you Instagram fed you to me. So sometimes it does its job. (laughs) And there was that something about you that was like, there is just something about her. And I didn't, you know, I didn't have an about me reel. It was before reels, but there was just something about you. And so I was starstruck when I saw you, I was sitting in a class with you and I went over and all these people are talking to her because people love her. And I'm like, I'm just going to wait, I'm just going to wait. And I just said, hi, like I'm Christina. I really love your content. It's so great to meet you in person. I just loved this post or something. And you looked at me and you saw me and you said, thank you so much. Like, thank you for, and you engaged with me. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's as rare now Mm -hmm. at Haven 2024, but at Haven 2019, Mm -hmm. that was super rare. Um, And so I just want to thank you for that and let everybody know that she's one of those people that is the same on the internet as she is in real life. And so just thank you for that encouragement to me. It helped in my creator journey to be like, there are real people. Mm -hmm. There are like, I can, I just need to find my people. So that was just really beautiful. Thank you. (laughs) Well, I want to talk, I mean, because you are a successful content creator and you have, I mean, to me, it seems like a very unique standout approach to how you um, do content, how Mm -hmm. you release it, how you engage with people following you. And so I kind of want to dive into that a little bit because I know, and and I'm curious if your military background or your family background um, kind of influence this, but you have good boundaries yes. around how you interact <laughs> yes. with, I I with people <laughs> on your social media mm-hmm. uh, in a, in a very healthy way mm-hmm. that protects your mental health. Mm-hmm. And I haven't seen that before, but I love it. And I'm mm-hmm. so curious. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes, um, I would say it's a mix of a lot of things. My upbringing, um, my family dynamic growing up. <laughs> I grew up with four sisters. There's seven of us. I grew okay. up with four sisters. So there's five five of us. Okay. No one can hurt my feelings like my sisters did when I was a child. Yeah. Like if you're on the internet, you got to do better than like the name calling, you know, and like calling out like physical features like, mm-hmm. really? Like, yeah. Yeah. come on. <laughs> um, so... It, and I don't want to tell people you need to have a tough skin to be a content creator because you absolutely do not. But I do like to tell people it is very healthy to set boundaries because the parasocial relationships that we set up in the way that social media is, people get really brave behind a screen mm-hmm. and they think they could just send off a message to you. Mm-hmm. And so I like to always say, if you're not going to say it to my face, yeah, mm-hmm. you know, um, however, hood Monica where I'm from, <laughs> like healed Mon- you know, healed Monica handles things different than, than good Monica. Um, so the discipline does come in and I like to be assertive and not come off aggressive mm-hmm. because I'm never going to be, you're never going to see me angry. Yeah. You're never going to see me um, be, mm, what's the word I'm looking for? You're going to see it in a very tactful way. And that mm-hmm. does come from a military background. Um, and so now I want to growing into a phase of my adulthood where I'm, I'm not putting up with people's stuff 
Like mm -hmm. maybe in my twenties I would have because I really wanted people to like me. Yeah. But now in my forties I'm like, oh no no no. <laughs> I every second of my day I'm going to make it worth my time, hmm. my mental health, all the things. So on social I make it very clear. I have a, a highlight bubble that reads boundary and it's got some safe slides that I have on there. And one of my you know the main one says in my house we say hello please and thank you, especially for people who are just shooting off DMs that you don't really have. And, you know prior connection or engagement or communication with like you wouldn't walk into my house kick your shoes off and go jump on my couch and not say hello to me yeah. you know so you know a hello please and thank you goes a long way mm -hmm. and that's not me being rude that's not me being unrealistic i think that's just very healthy to set boundaries with people and remind them you're a human being on the other end of that yeah. um, and then also like if you're rude to me or if you're mean to me I'm just not going to engage them. You're going to get blocked and now you don't get to see my content. Like yeah. it is what it is. And I'm very clear about that. Mm -hmm. So I will do regular reminders in my Instagram stories. Yeah. You know, if you're new here, if you missed it, go check out the bubble. If you've been here a while and you need a reminder, here's the highlight bubble. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really important for people just for mental health and for their sanity. Mm -hmm. And I also remind people to take advantage of the built-in tools um, on platforms, especially Instagram, where you can filter out specific words or yeah. you can do a thing where only you can only get DMs and comments on your posts from existing followers. And so, you know, the random person yeah. who comes Oh my gosh, that's such a good point. That is a, a good point. Video, yeah. yeah. Um, because event, you know, if you have a video that performs really well mm -hmm. and on any platform. Yeah eventually it finds the other side yeah right yeah. viewers yeah. that don't agree with you and they yeah. start maybe bashing you or giving you their really mean and solicited opinions and I, there at one point i was really busy dealing with the whole lot and i just didn't have the capacity to respond or even see it i just like i don't i don't need that i don't have the bandwidth to take on the negativity and have my thick skin so i just turned that off yeah you have to follow me right. in order to leave a comment. And if you really, really, really are passionate about your comment, you're going to have to follow me. Wait a week. And yeah. <laughs> you'll be able to yeah. comment. So that's a way to do it if you, you know, aren't maybe confident enough to voice that or write it out in a story. Is just make those changes within the platforms, protect your mental health. Mm -hmm. You do not have to be at the mercy of the people on the other side of those screens. Wow. I love that. I know. I love that. I think you could teach a whole class on that too. Really though. <laughs> to content creators. Okay. So there were two <laughs> things that you said in your keynote speech that I really loved and I'd love for you to expand on. Mm -hmm. And it was two things. You said balance is BS. That got a standing mm -hmm. ovation from me. And <laughs> niche is overrated. So can you <laughs> just okay. go a little bit more in detail yes. about those two statements? Yes. Balance does not exist. And whenever I hear, you know, that hustle, hustle culture mentality, and, you know, you got to keep going and you get up at 4 a.m. and you go do your workout and you, you know, do your journaling and all these things. I'm like, I don't, I can't do that. I've got two small children at home. I've got a business I'm trying to run, a house I'm trying to maintain, a husband I'm trying to keep happy. And all of these things in between that, as well as my own mental health. There is no way for me to balance out so everybody gets an equal slice of that pie. It's just not going to happen for me. Maybe there are people out there that do that, and I love that for them, and I'm happy for them. That doesn't work for me. No. Mm -hmm. So what I like to say is that I take it day to day. What needs my attention today? What is the priority today? Maybe it's my house because I haven't done laundry in today's and my kids are coming running out of socks. <laughs> you know, um, Maybe it's my business because I haven't posted anything of value in over a, you know a month and i need to get back on that because i know i'm trying to plan for a brand partnership and i want to get going on my content and build some momentum or maybe it's a day night with my husband because we haven't seen each other you know in a couple of weeks and really sat down and have uninterrupted time together so i take it day by day what needs my intention at that moment and i i, I think that's a healthy way to approach it if you can do it yeah, I really like I it just kind of blew my mind because I think the word balance has just sort of lost yeah. its meaning yes. almost. Yeah. Like you have to find the harmony. That's like oh, find yeah. the harmony. There you the go. You're looking for the harmony. 
I well, love you that. said in that keynote speech too, you said, I haven't posted a reel in a month. And I think there was a, like a collective gasp, gasp. Or like, yeah. to my feed. Yes. I've been in stories, but I haven't posted to my feed maybe yeah. in a month. And there was a collective gasp because there are so many people mm-hmm. that are so chained to like, if I do not feed this mm-hmm. Instagram, I will not get anything. And I, you also said like following is dead. And I totally agree with mm-hmm. you. It gets my foot in the door, but the past two campaigns I got put po- like hired for, this month yeah. really had nothing to do with my following. It yeah. honestly had nothing to do with my engagement. Mm-hmm. They they found me, they were casting, they found me, they liked me, I had a presence and I got those deals. Exactly. And so it's like, you don't have to have the high engagement. It yeah. helps, you don't have to have the following. It helps, but you can be, the casting mm-hmm. directors are out there looking to cast people with a certain look that have a certain cadence that in this demographic mm-hmm. that do this thing. Mm-hmm. And if you're gardening, they, they don't care, yeah. like they, I don't know. It just blew yeah. my mind. No, you're absolutely right. Yeah. It has to do with the quality and the, quality, the value yeah. that you bring to right. the table, like, yeah. you yeah. know, the imaginable table. Um, it, the following is dead. Where well, I know I'm going off yeah. the tangent. I'm going to yeah, yeah. answer okay. your question. No, but these the are all good. The following is 100% yeah. dead. Yeah. Um, so why am I going to put energy into creating a reel every single day to post to my feed on Instagram if I got to go focus on my kids yeah. because yeah. they've got picture day coming up and mm-hmm. you know, one's got to get a haircut and we've got to get an outfit and you know, the whole thing, or they got to go to the dentist. Like I'm going to put my focus where it needs to be yeah. for me to be a productive member of society and my family. Right. And yes, my business is important. And yet I monetize in various ways so that I have that flexibility. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Following is dead. I haven't posted anything to my feed in a month. And the proof that quality content is important I'm still getting follows. I'm still yeah. getting engagement on mm-hmm. because I've built a catalog in my portfolio. That's what I like to call my in feed things yeah. on Instagram. It's a portfolio. Right. It's a place where I put content that is easy to access. It's educational. It's entertaining. It's a place where brands can go and see the type of content I'm able to create in case they want to work together. And reels are for reach. That's like the thing I tell people. Like yeah, that's my biggest takeaway yeah. this whole weekend. Yeah, I reels, needed to hear it. Yes, I needed to hear it. Reach. Yeah, they're not for your existing community. Yeah. I am in my Instagram stories every single day, mm-hmm. no matter what. Generally, mm-hmm. unless I need a complete break from yeah. that, I'll take a day or two. That is where you foster your existing community if you're on Instagram. Reels, that's for reach. And I'm like, I, I'm my goal right now is not to grow. My goal is to foster my existing community support my engagement, um, really have connections with people. I'm working on the school and that community with yeah. within the community right. and, and supporting that. And that's where my energy is because that is a sustainable form of income for me. It's also a sustainable just business model. Um, and and it's, it's such a great community. So my energy is there. Mm-hmm. And not in posting a reel to, to grow my Instagram. It's yeah. just not. But I'm still growing because yeah. I have good, good valuable content. content right i'm not i don't feel that yeah. pressure that's yeah. the thing i feel like and i i don't know i get caught up in this trap some way and there's a hundred ways to do instagram there's a mm-hmm. hundred different ways to do something but i just think that sometimes people just want to hear if you do this 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 and this you'll be successful on instagram Fletcher. and it's just not the way it is no mm-hmm. and they that's want like the format and i'm like formula there's a no. formula that works for this person but like wouldn't you rather create your own formula so exactly. that you're not following someone else's template the whole reason that we're creators is so that we're not put into these boxes and like honestly when it boils down to it it's just like quality and consistency and not like being a slave to consistency like i have to post five times a week it's just like they're still showing up i mean you're still yeah. showing up in your stories yeah. but you have found like it's okay if i don't post in feed every day yeah. looking at my business objectives and where my income is coming mm-hmm. in and i think people are so terrified to make decisions like that yeah because they want, oh, is everybody doing that? But what are you doing? But what are you doing? And so, I yeah, know. I if think it's go- important to, to have conversations like this so people can hear the other yes. side of that. Now, if yeah. my goal was to grow and I'm like, I want to grow 50,000 followers yeah. in the next six, like r- reels every yeah. three days or every yeah. two days. But I you're would- saying following's dead, so you don't want to do that. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But like you said, you. it's going to yeah. get you in the door. Yeah. yeah. That number is going to get you in the door yeah. for brand deals, for whatever it is that your other goals might be. Right. That's not my goal yeah. for me. Mm-hmm. It's just not. Um, to answer the second part of your question, niching down. Yes. A lot. And this is this is also why I don't sell one-off courses or, you know, one-off 
downloadables because everybody has a different learning style everybody yeah. has a different goal mm -hmm. and that's why we have the community yeah. because then you can tailor to what it what it is that you need mm -hmm. when it comes to having a niche um, and someone asked during the keynote someone who i consider to be a very successful creator and has gone to do amazing things was struggling with feeling boxed in mm -hmm. to her current niche and she was like how do i break out of that and thinking, I've been thinking about it ever since, and I, I wish I would have said, that's why you don't want a niche down in the first place. Because when you're tired of it, and when you're ready to move on, or it doesn't work for you, or you've outgrown it, you feel boxed in, and you're like, how am I going to expand on that now? Well, maybe I shouldn't have done it in the first place. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I tell people, if you're a personal brand, if you're building a personal brand on social, if you've got a product-based or service-based business, you want to become your niche. Yeah. Yes. You yeah. want I to be the that theme you said that, that yeah. everybody yeah. thinks about about that. And that happened accidentally for me. Okay. Very organically. And I have found that over the most recent years, I do things intuitively and instinctively. When people ask me why, and I'm like, I just if it, it felt right or it felt mm -hmm. good. When in reality is the experience that I have up until that moment have dictated that decision. Mm -hmm. And it was mm -hmm usually the right one for me. I mm -hmm. went with, I followed my gut and it worked and I'm just going to keep doing that thing. <laughs> and so I went in my, in my first Haven 2019, I went to Alt Summit and I, you know, started trying to network with people and asking people like, you know, for advice and, you know, will you do a little audit? I have questions. And one of the reoccurring things at that time was people telling me, you need to pick one thing you're, you're doing, you want to yeah. do a lot. You need to pick one thing. You need to really hone in on that. You need a niche down. And I was just like, I don't want to stay in a lane. I don't want to stay in one box because that's not who I am as a person. And that's not what I want my brand to be. I do all of these things. It's very real for me to have side quests. Like I am a side quest queen. <laughs> Whatever I'm feeling like, moment, I have neurodivergence. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Are you kidding me? And like, that, that's impossible. <laughs> right. It's like, okay, I'm driving to, you know, the, the hardware store to pick up some paint. Oh, there's some furniture on the side of the road for, you know, never uh -huh. mind. Let's do this instead. Like, that's who I really, really yeah, am. Yeah. And I want people to be part of that and mm -hmm. see that. And I'm finding that I'm not alone in that process not, as a creator yeah. and as a, a person. A person. Yeah. So I really like to share different facets of myself. Um, it, it diversifies my content, number one. Mm -hmm. It makes it sustainable, so I'm not stuck with one thing. And it gives me the creative freedom to pick and choose what I want to do at any given moment and share with people. And also tap into different streams of income as a result with affiliate links for clothes. Like, I'm a, I'm a, I started as a DIYer in, in you know, home design. Like all of us, and, and I tell people, I'm not a fashion influencer, but very real people ask me, for a link to that because yeah, yeah. because the, your shoe game is strong yes it is <laughs> thank you. Thank you. or someone will say i'm the same height which is actually a pain point like yeah. i'm mm -hmm. five foot tall yeah and so if i'm wearing something that someone thinks is flattering on mm -hmm. my body type and they have the same one they are going to want that link and they're going to go purchase it so it's i have my little diehard group of you know when it comes to the fashion thing yeah so sharing more lifestyle things or real for me it's i call it people call it lifestyle but it's it's real life things yeah. you tap into more connection with your community yeah. you tap into other forms of in, you know income and things like that so when it comes to niching down i don't think most people should mm -hmm. my only exception to that is if it's hyper specific if you are wanting to tailor to a very very specific solution for a certain group of people you will grow very, very fast, and that community will go so hard for you mm -hmm. because they will learn to know, love, and trust you because of the ultra relatability and dependability of that thing. So, if you're, I say this a lot, if you're a fashion creator, it's not just, oh, I'm a fashion creator, here's all of my beautiful outfits. No, it's I create content for a petite. Mm -hmm. mid-sized woman yeah. who wants corporate workwear to the office yeah. like that is so specific and some people are like well who's gonna how are you gonna grow a community who's even going to watch your content or engage or oh no those are some of the biggest communities yeah. yes they are when it yeah. comes to food you yeah. want to narrow it down to you know cook, cooking for a family of 10 on a budget during busy weeknight meals for working parents like oh that's me let me get in there and let yeah. me let me really watch all of these and follow yeah. them so if you're going to go ultra, like hyper specific, you will do well. 
there's consistency, there's some discipline there. Mm -hmm. Um, that's the only time I recommend yeah. niching down. And that, that is like a concept that I've heard by someone who I really respect is Pat Flynn. And mm -hmm. he has that book, like a thousand super fans. Yeah. And so if you are that ultra niche down, you just need the a thousand people to yeah. ride or die for you and Absolutely. you can make a career out of it, mm -hmm. which sounds like, I mean, it's equally as hard as having millions that yeah. are not really invested. Mm -hmm. They're both very yeah. hard, but it's like, which strategy do you want to choose? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And I do think it's possible to create content with a wider niche or wider umbrella for your content pillars and have maybe segments mm -hmm. or have a series that speaks to a certain demographic and certain group of people. Yeah. For me with gardening, it's practical gardening. Mm -hmm. I'm not a master gardener. I didn't yeah. go to school. <laughs> it's just like stuff that I've learned from, you know, what right. killing plants yeah. over time or watching my parents do it. And so I am very, very clear that it's practical gardening. Like you're not going to learn advanced skills. You're going to watch like the real uh, process here with me with that. And that's a little bit more specific in, in a segmented way within my content. Mm -hmm. Well, I would love to know, cause you know, we're here at Haven Conference and you are a successful creator. You've built a community, but you still keep coming back to Haven. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us a little bit about why and what value you see in conferences like this? Mm -hmm. Even if I wasn't speaking, I would come just for the connection with people. I have friends and it's so funny. We see each other. We're like, Oh, our annual, you know, meetup together. And we pick up right where we left off from last year. Yeah. And I know this is probably the only time all year I'm going to see them because yeah. we live across the country from one another. Yeah. So I would still come for the connection with my friends and the connection with peers. I see every other content creator as my coworker. They're mm -hmm. my peer. And even though we don't work in an office in a little cubicle, you're my peer, you're my coworker. You, we have so much in common. You understand the highs and the lows of what we do in this industry. And we're all just really trying to keep figuring it out and also connecting with the brands. That is another really, really important part of it. So I would come even if, it, if, if, if I felt like I wasn't going to get something out of a class, that would be my main motivation. But I sit through classes, even though I've been doing this for a long time, like Kyle's storytelling class. I think I do really, I, I, I work really hard with my storytelling, but there's always something to learn. Yeah, there is and always the something to learn. repetition is so crucial yeah. in that because even if I heard a class three years ago on something, I'm looking at it with different eyes yeah. now. Yeah. Right. So I think that's still really important to keep learning yeah. no matter where you are, what yeah. you do. I such think that's such good, good advice because yeah. it's so hard to be like, well, I've been before. I know, I know what it, it is. Mm -hmm. I heard yeah. that person speak before. I don't need help on that topic. Yeah. And it's, it's expensive. So I'm just gonna, it's mm -hmm. a lot. It's an it investment. Is. And we talk about it. Like it is an investment mm -hmm. to do conferences, but I can, you know, count just the connections and maybe that introduction to that brand that turned into a brand partnership, maybe a year or two later, you don't necessarily see the return right away, mm -hmm. but I always believe there is a return in your time and your money yes. for investing in things like this. 100%. So like save up for them. They're really important and have, I know propelled me and I've like, you're one of those friends that yeah. I'm like, I can't wait to see it. Well, I'll also engage with your content and I really like you too. Yeah. But like being able to see you in person, like it's just, it, it's something different. Yes. Mm -hmm. Like if I would have never met you in person, I don't think I would like, it's a catalyst yeah. and yes. So no. And it fills no. your creative heart. Like yes. for me, it fills my yeah. cup to be able to come and connect yes. and it's exhausting because I'm so exhausting. I'm an introvert. Same. Like, yeah. I Same. I'm home. so tired. I want to go home so bad. I'm going to need seven to 10 business days to recover <laughs> <Yeah>. in the <laughs> quiet under my weighted blanket. Like nobody <laughs> talked to me. I know that, but yeah. I also know it's worth it. Right. Mm -hmm. And it just fills my cup creatively. It fills my heart. I get to go home and I feel energized and mm -hmm. I brain dump and write down yeah. all the ideas and everything that I learned. So that when I'm refreshed and have rested, I can maybe make some changes or implement things here or follow yeah. up with brands, follow with, up with friends. Mm -hmm. so. yeah. yeah. Well, so as we kind of wrap this up, I just wanted to know one more thing from you. And that would be to somebody out there who's like a baby creator sitting at home. Maybe they didn't make the investment in Haven. You know, I know people are always coming to you for advice and like, what should I do here? But what would just general your general advice for mm -hmm. somebody in that position, just starting out, looking to grow their business mm -hmm. and has aspirations to be where you're at one day. The beginning is the best part to be. It's, <laughs> it's my favorite place for a creator to be. And it's something that I miss being 
a growing I, I when people are like I'm a small creator no you're a growing account you're a growing creator yeah. and also we're people like let's rem let's be real here so I like to tell people that is the best place to be at the beginning mm -hmm. you get to make all the mistakes and 200,000 people are, aren't probably gonna you know like see it let's be real you get to learn so much you can experiment with so many different mm -hmm. strategies type of content and it's such a forgiving place to be and you're really forming the foundation of who you are as a creator and you get to try all those things it's such a fun place to be and I get excited when people are at that part of their journey so that they can form that and build it brick by brick so what I like to tell people is don't be afraid to just literally throw spaghetti at the wall and yeah. see what sticks yeah yeah and pay attention to what people respond to and when we talk about you know the following being dead and the interest-led algorithms you can create an account tomorrow yeah. And have a million sets of eyes yep. see you, your message, mm -hmm. what it is that you do. Like it is a very level playing field right. because of the interest led algorithms. Yeah. And so I like to just tell people to go for it and yeah. just see what happens. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, I love I that. I love that. Gosh, Thank you, Monica, for taking so the time. So much. From fellow introverts to another introvert. Yes. At the end of the conference, yes. I know this is really hard to sit down, but there are just so many good nuggets that I know are going to bless people. So thank you for being here with Thank us you. Today. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. And we will be putting in the description box all the different places that you can find Monica. If you want more information on the School of Esperanza, we'll put that link there mm -hmm. too. Go find her, follow her, engage with her content. I mean, you will not regret you will not be disappointed yeah <laughs> and we'll be back again soon with another podcast so we'll see you next time in the cypress room <laughs>